Welcome back to Close Up. There's a certain image people have in their heads about the average New Hampshire voter, but is that idea accurate? Dr. Dante Scala is here to discuss a New Hampshire new study from the University of New Hampshire on the changing nature demographically of the New Hampshire electorate. Thanks for being here, Doctor. You're welcome. I appreciate your time. So uh, one of the numbers that jumped right out to me was this percentage of eligible voters who were not eligible to vote in the state uh, four years ago. 20%. That's huge. That's almost a quarter of the electorate that didn't participate the last time. Yeah, so my colleagues, Ken Johnson, Andy Smith, and I were looking at both survey numbers and then overall demographic numbers. And a portion of that 20% are people who are now old enough to vote. But the majority of those new voters are people who have moved here from out of state. And that just underscores uh, the fact that we have one of the most mobile populations in the state. You know, the, the old saying is that, you know, New Hampshire voters have been here forever. Uh, they lived in the North Country. They voted in 12, you know, they've been here for 12 generations. Yeah. But really, the reality is it's more people like me who have moved here from out of state. They were born somewhere else, lived somewhere else, but moved to New Hampshire and settled here. It's often a, probably an overlooked aspect of the primary, the idea of experience. People who have experienced politics in other states and see it operate here, and it's obviously vastly more participatory usually than places that, for instance, that I came from, like Oregon, where you don't see anyone who's elected almost ever. But right. How does that interplay with the primary in our politics here? You have these people with different perspectives bringing those to bear on the politics. Right, and so we see a couple different ways. One is people moving up from Massachusetts into New Hampshire, especially into the southern tier of the state, say from here in Manchester down to the state border. And typically those people get a lot of attention. Back in the day, they were blamed for making New Hampshire more liberal, blamed by conservatives, that is. But actually, a lot of those people are fairly moderate to conservative. Uh, but then there are also also retirees who come from, say, not Massachusetts, but perhaps New York, uh, other northeastern states, and they come up and they want to retire here, see the foliage in the fall, perhaps live here half the year and then winter somewhere else. But they bring their politics with them. And by the time you're 60, right, your politics are well established. And so you're going to start changing your area around you more than your environment is going to change you. What do you see in terms of party affiliation? These in-migration folks, are they joining up with either Democrats or Republicans? I think you're seeing them you know, roughly evenly go toward both parties. There's not necessarily a big uh, movement in party registration one way or the other, uh, as opposed to, say, uh, you know, younger voters and older voters. It's interesting, in the primary, I think the two ends, you know, those young voters and those baby boomers who are becoming the established voters in New Hampshire, uh, they represent more of the extremes of the primary. But I think those migrant voters who have perhaps moved into the state, they might uh, add more to the moderates. So for, if you're, say, an Amy Klobuchar or a Joe Biden or a Pete Buttigieg, you might be looking to try to reach out to those voters who have moved to the state recently. They don't like Donald Trump very much, but they're not necessarily uh, looking for a, a very progressive Democrat. Right. In the anecdotal experience that I gather, a lot of those people you hear from, oh, I moved here, I've been here five years, four years, whatever it is, uh, they like to do the undeclared thing because they might come from a state that was a closed primary and they thought, well, I had to, I was forced to go one way or the other to participate in those ones, and they like being able to play around yeah. the way they do here. Uh, one note, I, I do believe that we have, a, you know, this is hot take culture these days on the primary, but I still think that the gold standard for, uh, if you want to learn about the New Hampshire primary, is your book, Stormy Weather, from a decade or so ago. There was a very interesting concept you came up with in this called an elite score, and this was more specific. You were looking at a Democratic primary, and the idea that um, the more affluent a town was versus the more working class a town was, and how that worked in terms of, you know, a, a candidate's future success. The idea essentially that um, if you were relying too heavily on the elites, the college educated, the more affluent, you were less likely to be the nominee eventually. And that if you go back and apply it in past elections, you do see a balanced score from a Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton and things like that. Uh, how does this metric evolved and what do you see this time around? Is there anyone out there in this contest who, you, who we should see a red flag with their affluent score perhaps? Uh, I'm sorry, elite score or, uh, or perhaps someone that we aren't paying attention to who would do really well? So the metrics evolved in the sense that now we have more elite voters than we used to say when the book was written back in 2003. So there's a greater percentage of people who make say $100,000 or more, their household does, who are gonna vote in the Democratic primary. There are fewer voters who are just high school educated. There are fewer voters who make a working class income. So if anything, 
our state's Democratic primary has become more uh, dominated by elite voters. So if you're, say, a Pete Buttigieg, uh, here's someone who has been appealing so far, both in New Hampshire and nationally, to that more affluent voter. He's someone who could be, just like Gary Hart was uh, back in the 1980s, someone who could do really well here, but then struggle uh, going forward, not just with minority voters, but also perhaps with white working class voters who will be more prominent in states after New Hampshire. And how about Trump as, uh, you know, he likes to compare himself to Andrew Jackson sometimes, mm. but in the sense that he is some, in some ways reordering some of that white working class support. You, you mentioned in your book towns like Claremont and Rochester, these were once, you know, rock solid sort of like towns where Democrats can go eat those working class votes. And now it's a little bit more like Trump country. How does it work on that end? Yeah, definitely. You see in the 2016 election, places like Coas County, way up north, and then out uh, in Claremont, right, Sullivan County, those places swung to the right uh, for Donald Trump in 2016 in the general election as well as in the primary. So the question for, say, a Joe Biden or a Bernie Sanders who's trying to appeal to those white working class voters in places like Rochester and Summersworth, can they get those Trump voters who are perhaps registered independent or undeclared to come over and vote in the Democratic primary? Or are those people by and large going to stay loyal to Donald Trump and they're not even going to bother voting in the Democratic primary because they're already set to go vote for Trump's reelection? And the name of your book, Stormy Weather, Stormy Weather is apt to in the sense that it's been a while that we've had a primary where weather has interacted with the vote. And uh, it seems like the last few Februarys, there's been some snow. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Absolutely. Dr. Dante Scala, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. We appreciate your time.